will restart by resharing it, okay? So what, I, what, what am I gonna do now? So should I stop sharing? Or? I will just introduce you. So um, welcome back everyone. Uh, this is the second part of the day. I'm very glad to have uh, one of my friend and colleague, Dr. Anil Joshi, good morning Anil. Hi, how are you doing? Good, thank you so much. So uh, Anil and I went uh, five, four years ago, I guess, I, I, oh, two years ago, it was in London. We had a panel together and I was impressed by the techniques uh, and the skills from Anil. And uh, for those who don't know, he just uh, uh, been a general secretary of the uh, British Society of Fetal Plastic Surgery. And he's also a national delegate of the United <laughs> K for European Ac uh, Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery. So today I requested from, uh, from Anil to talk about uh, one of the most interesting uh, um, anatomical spaces in, the in, in our face, which is the nasal septum. And um, regarding to this, he will talk about uh, the deviation of the nasal septum and how uh, this could be functionally improved uh, in, a, in such a way that he will present to you. So for those of attendees, please do remind that all the questions should be asked at the end of his talk. Thank you, Anil, and please go ahead with uh, your presentation. Hi, good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, good morning, wherever everybody is. Uh, thank you, Puya, for your excellent introduction. And uh, uh, a few days ago, we both were discussing as to uh, what would be the nice topic uh, for people who are around uh, um, registrars or the resident levels, or even consultants for that matter. And then we thought uh, we should discuss the functional aspects as there are quite a few things which need to be approached. And uh, here we go. So we are gonna have a quick chat about it. And these are my affiliations. Can you can you share it once again? Because I've stopped it for you. And yeah. please do do share it again. Uh, you wait a second. Uh, share the screen, is it or? No, I've ended it for you. I'm sorry. Um, wait a second. Let me. Uh... Great. You Thank got it you. right. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. There we go. Um, it's uh, back again. Uh, so the topic today is going to be on deviated nose with its uh, functional aspects. And uh, why are we discussing this uh, situation in the first place? There's, it's a challenge uh, uh, to provide a, a good balance between the aesthetics and the function. We've got to know what are functions and what are aesthetics. And it's uh, marrying these things together is uh, the key for any doctor or a surgeon. And uh, the difficulty here is, I'm not sure if you can see the picture here, because I think some of the names are around here. Uh, but anyway, so the difficulty is uh, you can see this case, for example, the uh, patient has got such a severe deviated uh, dorsum and the septum. And uh, these, we've got to really accept that uh, these are difficult problems for us and uh, go to the ground level understand the concepts behind these things before we jump in for any surgical interventions. And if you again look at this case as a um, prototype, uh, the contributions here would be with uh, the septum itself, where it could involve both its uh, bony and the cartilaginous uh, positions. Uh, there could be deviations of either of these or both, and the dorsum, which will involve uh, some of the bones and the upper lateral cartilages along with the tip work mechanism and its support as well. Therefore, before we dig in into any surgical procedures, we've got to understand why we are going to intervene in these situations. And even if we do, we've got to understand that we cannot compromise on the support system because that will destroy the uh, a nice harmony between the aesthetics and the function. So here, if we take nose as uh, the center of our attention or the uh, form today. And uh, these are the concepts around which we've got to work on. So uh, there's the form of the nose, the functions of what the nose is all about and the aesthetics regarding the nose. So we've got to have this harmonious balance between all three of these for us to have a best possible presentation for the patient. So now, I say form, but what exactly is the form? So if you look at the meaning, it's the 
shape or the visible shape or configuration of any material. So what you see is kind of what you get. However, for what you see, there are other important structures inside it or underneath it, which will give this kind of form. And then aesthetics. Look at the definition of aesthetics. It's a set of principles which are concerned with the nature and the appreciation of the beauty, which means that uh, we've got to appreciate what is natural things, and then that will automatically camouflage into what uh, uh, aesthetics are all about. Function. What's the uh, job of this organ or a person or a thing? That is the function, the activity which is naturally occurring for such material or a person or an organ, in this case, the nose. So this uh, congruity between all of these three will give you the integrated approach towards the nose and its strength and the form and the function. Look at all of these uh, cases here. There are various sh shapes and sizes. And look at this first case. His nose is completely mashed up. And in fact, when he came to me, this was his, uh, uh, he had already had three surgeries in the past. And uh, look at all the uh, severely deviated dorsum, boxy tip, and it was in a mess. And you look at the second one, the uh, patient does have a uh, C-shaped deformity of the dorsum. Third one is a mixture of a few things there. And fourth one would be a, a reverse C-shaped deformity there. So all in all, there are different varieties that we've got to think of. And there's no one single technique tailor-made. You've got to think of the concepts and work around the principles. And these are similar schematic pictures of what I've uh, just explained. The S-shaped, the um, C-shaped ones, and linear uh, oblique ones. In the first ones, in, in the first one rather, uh, there could be uh, bony structural, as in the dorsal, along with the bony uh, um, uh, septal deviation as well, including the deviations of the cartilaginous portion and along with the uh, upper lateral cartilages here. And this is all mix and match of each of these to give you these specific examples. So what are nasal functions? We automatically think, especially in terms of septorhinoplasty, that it's going to be the breathing aspect. However, uh, patients got to smell, air conditioning, humidifying the air, which is then going to go and reach the uh, lungs, protection of the uh, respiratory tract. And uh, in fact, facial expressions and aesthetics are also part of uh, facial function or the nasal function. And in fact, speech production is also quite important. And any changes, as we know, uh, these would lead to hyper or hyponasality of uh, the nasal voice. So um, today, our approach would be basically towards the surgical solutions for some of these deformities that we are talking about. And the points of uh, discussion here would be to understand the valves which are the internal and the external nasal valves. Um, then we come down to the septoplasties, some of these septal strengthening concepts and spreader grafts, which could be involved in these cases. I would not uh, go too much into osteotomies or tip support as this would uh, really take a lot of our time as uh, Puya has given me orders to uh, finish on time. And before we start off, we've got to analyze the patient. One point that we've got to really understand or think is, in fact, in a major number of cases of post-septorhinoplasty nasal obstruction, these are due to failure to adequately diagnose and treat any pre-operative situations, which means that if there are any other underlying conditions, they have to be looked at and treated accordingly before we purely go in for nasal breathing or uh, the uh, aesthetics. Therefore, a careful preoperative history examination and planning uh, for functional portions of the internal nose is in fact as important as the aesthetic improvement of the external part of the nose. Hence, uh, if we are making any compromises in our surgery for either of these, 
this can severely downgrade even the most beautiful results. 70% of uh, nasal airflow, air, airflow to lungs is de delivered by the nose. Some of the nasal obstruction symptoms, which are also on the asymptomatic scores, are the nasal congestion, nasal blockage, trouble uh, breathing through the nose, trouble sleeping, and difficulty getting enough air through the nose, both due to exertion of um, work and exercise. These are quite uh, important and subtle that you have to pick up in, for example, people who are very fit in, into uh, severe exercises or sportsmen, some of the footballers and uh, the rugby players who come to us who uh, would complain initially of these points. And if you look at uh, this uh, picture, when we open the nose and look at the deviation and also the uh, valvular collapse here, the uh, lateral cartilage has severely fallen in. Preoperative assessment therefore would also include, these may sound cliched, but we have to really look at the history and evaluation of these. Uh, I spoke about the nasal obstruction, but we also have to uh, ask the patients regarding any of uh, drug abuse, because in my practice, I do get a lot of patients uh, with uh, cocaine abuse, which in some of them also are mixed with the levimazole, uh, which is one of the other uh, ingredients, which can severely deform the uh, nasal structure. And uh, we also have to uh, uh, look at uh, their uh, psychological aspects. And if there are any points that you are uh, concerned about, you've got to involve your psychologist or a psychiatrist without any further delay. Coming to the external appearance and facial analysis, these are critical. These are fairly obvious for any residents in ENT or facial plastic surgery practice, looking at the uh, one thirds from both the profile and the frontal views. We've also got to uh, understand the tip recoil mechanism, which will also give you the understanding of the intrinsic strength of the nasal dorsum. And internal nasal examination, both with anterior rhinoscopy and flexible nasal endoscopy are very important, both with and without decongestion, as this would also give you the information regarding the internal nasal valve as well, or if there are any polypoidal changes or um, a pus formation from the sinuses. As I mentioned, some of the nasal obstruction scores earlier, uh, some of the residents uh, who are mainly based towards rhinology uh, would uh, be well aware of uh, these uh, nasal scores. And there are various other scores which uh, are validated, which I would recommend you to use them. Clinical photography is of paramount important, and you've got to take it from all views that we are all aware of. Cortical uh, test is important. This uh, picture is in fact a, a modified cortical test with the uh, uh, a small probe, which could potentially help you open up both the internal and the external nasal valve to understand if there is any collapse at all. To rule out any other underlying condition and also any severe nasal deformity as well, I generally go for CT scans of the uh, uh, nose and the paranasal sinuses. And in some cases with the mucosal disease, I go for ROST test, which is for immunology and skin prick test to rule out any common allergens. If the turbinates are hypertrophy, they could cause internal nasal valve stenosis and the turbinates uh, uh, hypertrophy could both be uh, bony as well as mucosal disease. And majority of the cases, you could go for medical management or surgical management if that fails to respond with uh, uh, submucosal diathermy, or I uh, usually use uh, a, a coblation uh, technique here. If uh, there's underlying sinusitis, sinus disease will have to be taken care of with uh, steroidal sprays or uh, uh, tablets if there are polypoidal changes and antibiotics. And if uh, those are resistant, uh, we may have to go for surgical intervention. Understanding the nasal septum itself, there are uh, in fact five bones, if you can see here. We start here with the premaxilla and then go backwards to maxillary crest and palatine crest at the back. And posterior, superiorly and inferiorly, we do have the uh, ethmoidal plate and the vomer. 
And as you can see here, the quadrangular cartilage is very tightly tucked in here in between these two bones. And when you are operating any of your cases for septoplasty or septorhinoplasty, you may have found uh, difficulty in the, the anterior nasal spine region. This is possibly due to the fact that there is a, a possible in, a, you know, intermixing of the periosteal and perichondrial fibers. So what I would advise for any of the bony resections at the back is to use sharp biting instruments rather than twisting instruments as the twisting ones could potentially uh, cause damage to the ethmoidal plate and further superiorly to its uh, skull base. This is the um, uh, schematic picture of the internal external nasal valve and uh, its uh, medial compartment has got its uh, uh, caudal septum, columella and premaxilla. Lateral compartment has uh, got uh, ala, the lobule and dilated muscles. Vestibular stenosis and uh, lateral nasal wall collapse are particularly important when looking at the external nasal valve collapse and these may well have to be uh, treated accordingly. Looking at the internal nasal valve, you do have uh, the septum here on the medial wall and the anterior nasal spine with the premaxilla, nasal flow, inferior turbinate and the lateral wall with upper lateral cartilage. And this is the site of maximal resistance uh, in uh, human nose. And the cross section is approximately 55 to 80 uh, millimeter square. And uh, the typical angle of the internal nasal valve is around 10 to 15 degrees and anything less than that could potentially cause uh, nasal obstruction. And you can see these examples, all of these would uh, potentially cause uh, a collapse of the internal nasal valve, uh, be it the lateral uh, wall collapse, uh, severe mucosal disease or septal deviation. Now looking at the lateral wall, uh, I would like to briefly enumerate certain uh, uh, techniques here, although we cannot really go into detail for the paucity of time. Butterfly grafts are something which uh, could be used as uh, you can see here, and they will uh, open up the uh, na in internal nasal valve. Lateral crural spring grafts are also used, and they typically come from the underneath of the upper lat uh, lower lateral cartilage and sit on the piriform aperture, uh, giving you a springy feeling. I do not use these much and therefore I had to purely go for a schematic picture here. And alar batten on leg grafts are the ones which you put on top of the uh, lower lateral cartilages, which will then give you the uh, strength from outside to give the uh, uh, lateral wall some grip and uh, uh, change the weakness. And similarly, you could use um, lateral cruel strut grafts. This is a schematic picture, and this is some of the cases which we've used, where unlike the previous case, you will have to put these grafts um, underneath the lateral crura and suture it and give them extra support. There are certain severe cases where we may have to go for ALR replacement or sometimes concave or a convex, concave to convex flip. But coming to the spreader grafts, um, simpler ones uh, would be the auto spreader where the, uh, in certain cases of deviated uh, noses or the dorsum, the asymmetry of the upper lats will uh, be taken advantage of that. And we make a partial resection of uh, the excess tissue here and curve them inwards to cause, uh, make them spreaders. And that would also kind of camouflage the middle one third of the dorsum in terms of aesthetic as well, along with opening up the internal nasal valve. Similarly, we could use uh, spreader grafts which are harvested from the septal cartilage uh, remnants or even the uh, 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 rib cartilage or conchal grafts. And these uh, could uh, then, and then potentially kept uh, uh, in various fashions. In this case, for example, this uh, we've uh, used it as an asymmetrical graft where we've uh, put it on the concave side. And also what I would do is uh, I would cross hatch this area and release the springiness in the cartilage and put in 4 uh, PDS. In certain cases to get a bit more symmetry, 
we will have to use uh, spreader groups on either sides and that will also give you a very good strength to the center part which is a septum and then we may have to uh, uh, sandwich the whole of these uh, five layered approach with the uh, uh, suture so uh, there are a lot of uh, residents and uh, junior doctors who would ask me uh, what approach would you take for your surgeries I would say what is good in your hands, what you've uh, experienced, what you're confident in, that is better. There's no one fast rule for these uh, kind of uh, approaches. Preparation is very key. I would initially uh, use uh, uh, gauze pieces which are soaked in uh, cocaine and adrenaline for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, in fact, I would uh, do these in my uh, anesthetic room itself before the patient is wheeled in uh, into the theater space. And by the time all the other things are organized, you will have uh, enough time to decongest the area. And then I will inject with uh, my personal preferences with a lignus pan, which is a 2% lignocaine with uh, 1 in 80,000 adrenaline. And it will also cause uh, hydrodissection of the uh, planes. And then we'll have to elevate uh, the perichondrium and the periosteum accordingly. And in certain nooks and corners, especially with uh, uh, severely deviated uh, septum, where there are uh, fractured segments, uh, there will be difficulty to uh, elevate the uh, lining. In such cases, sometimes there may well be a small tear. However, do not fret, but be careful that you do not tear on the contralateral side and also in the same position, that would uh, then be a difficult situation. If, however, you see that there is a uh, tear contralaterally and also on the uh, similar position. I would advise you to close that then and there rather than uh, pray and wait because invariably you may see a separate perforation post-op that is even more difficult to treat. And here is another picture where we've performed the elevation. You can see here the cartilage is so devi deviated and there's so much tension in the cartilage it's trying to spring out. Um, you know, take, taking, trying to take all of its attention across. And then we will have to uh, uh, form proper assessment of the uh, cartilage and the bone and before we embark on any resections, because once you do it, it's difficult to go back. Um, in this case, for example, here you can see there's a big fractured segment uh, and which was healed before we, were, we may have to break this and reshape all of these areas, reduce the tension, create more space to uh, keep these tissues into uh, a straight line. In certain situations, the cartilage may have slid off the maxillary crest and the premaxilla, and, that, and therefore this lower part may have overgrown over a period of years. And that may have to be later on shaved or uh, reshaped to bring it back into the center. Here you can see, uh, this is the anterior nasal spine. And this is a needle which uh, I've uh, tried to make a small puncture through which I will uh, paste a PDS suture and then suture it with the uh, lower end of the septum here of the core ledge. In some cases, in a lot, of, in fact, most of uh, the cases, the anterior nasal spine may well be in the center, but the cartilage may have uh, slid away, uh, and there uh, we may just have to put it in the center. However, in certain cases, the uh, uh, the wings of the nasal spine may be asymmetrical, wherein we may have to uh, sacrifice one of the wings and then use the other one to reshape it and position the cartilage in such a way that, that the cartilage and the uh, nasal spine together will form a congress point in the center of the uh, nose. And uh, in, there are various techniques with which you can put the sutures. Uh, sometimes you may just go through the body of the spine itself into the uh, cartilage or in certain cases we may have to go with the figure of eight uh, suture. And then we have to go for the bony work. Here you can see um, what is deflected, we may have to remove it or in certain cases we may also use some of the uh, bony um, uh, residual uh, positions uh, for grafting technique as well or in certain cases, we may have a composite cartilaginous and the bony uh, grafts, which we could refashion in certain cases. And, uh, and once you do that, then we may 
think of uh, harvesting the cartilage uh, graft here. As you can see here, we have left the uh, L strut of the dorsum and the caudal area of the uh, uh, septal cartilage intact. There you go. And we can use this whole thing to refashion various um, uh, cartilaginous uh, um, grafts for reconstruction. Here, as you can see, this is a uh, cartilage that I've excised, keeping the L struct intact here. And I also uh, use the uh, uh, cephalic portions of the lower lateral cartilages as well for minor camouflaging in a case later on. And this is a technique which I learned from Dr. Apaydin, who is one of the leading Turkish uh, surgeons. He's a very good friend of mine, who is the ex-president of AFPS and also my mentor. And he used to take cartilages based on L strut, which I'm going to show you later on. And here I have taken cartilage grafts. One is for the uh, columella strut for future grafting there. And then uh, a couple of these uh, uh, spreader grafts. And you can also see the length that which I commonly take. In some cases, the uh, deviations can be quite high. In such cases, it's quite difficult to repair without addressing this issue here. Here, you may cross hatch and then put a uh, graft on one side as a spreader and then put sutures and that will straighten it up. Or in other situations, we may have to excise that whole chunk of that middle segment and then use cartilage uh, spreader grafts on either sides. Or we could also use that L strut that I just uh, earlier showed you. So this L strut graft could be used uh, as a uh, graft here, where if there are, uh, for example, changes in this upper high deviation, or in the caudal area of deviation, both can be addressed at the same time with this graft having its own intrinsic strength. That is quite useful. However, in certain other situations, uh, it's also useful where if you want to elongate the nose, then you could also um, double this up as a septal extension graft as well, where you could just move it forwards and that would also give you more projection as well as lengthening the nose. And these are some of the techniques that you can see here. So in this particular case, I have uh, used uh, spreader grafts on either sides of the septum. And then you can see this uh, result post operatively on the table. And in this particular case, which was fairly similar here again, the uh, uh, rotation was uh, quite uh, down. So which we've could try to address as well and getting a smoother dorsum as well. Similarly, uh, this uh, lady also had a uh, fairly uh, satisfactory result. And so was this um, patient. All in all, the take home message is we've got to uh, understand the concepts. As I mentioned those three concepts earlier, the form, the aesthetics and the function, they all have to click in your head like clockwork. We've got to get those things in sync uh, before we even embark on any procedures. These are step-by-step -step approach. You can't jump from one first step to the fourth step. We've got to go in a very step laterally fashion and so that we are not going to miss anything and uh, all things are open in front of us. Similarly, uh, we can't take things for granted. We have to keep our eyes open. We may have learned one or two techniques, but they may well not be tailor-made to every single case. So we have to manufacture new things for each cases. And so the more you learn from others or attending uh, cadaveric dissection courses, uh, we also run one in Manchester every year. Uh, whoever wants to join these, feel free to contact us. And uh, thank you very much. If there are any questions, I'm more than happy to answer you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for presentation. And uh, also, anatomical drawings are very essential for the people to understand exactly how it is inside of, uh, of our nose. Uh, uh, before before approaching to the um, to the questions, uh, I do have one. Yep. Um, 
using a modification, we developed a, a technique, which is a modification of a Metzenbaum technique, yeah. which was a, like a whisk swinging door technique. Yes. Uh, so it, it's based on the anatomical landmark, which you know guide you to the maxilla and then you go forward. Uh, do you think that uh, that uh, we we can preserve uh, um, in and in a, such a way, not not this technique, but there's a kind of techniques that will lead you to preservation as much as possible of uh, of the cartilage and uh, leave also for for like you know reshaping of the external nose. Of course, yes. I mean, today I did not touch upon these points because it was slightly beyond the realms of uh, today's talk. However, in some of these cases where the torso looks uh, smooth uh, rather than too crooked, there we could uh, go for preservation techniques by taking the Webster's uh, triangle from the uh, sides of the piriform aperture of the dorsum and uh, then lowering down the uh, 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 septal cartilage itself uh, by taking a small piece, which I've learned, in fact, it's a new technique for me as well. I lear I've learned from some of the masters in Europe uh, and uh, with uh, you know, you know, Carlos, for example, he does a Tetris principle and Milos also does uh, a different variety. So yes, there are different uh, techniques which will also preserve that dorsal line uh, along with uh, keeping a lot of other cartilage intact. Uh, so it's uh, again uh, a matter of how much you get trained and then you've got to keep doing this on a regular basis and get the concepts in your head and uh, move it forwards. So let's start with the question. The first one yeah. from France. What is your mixture for anesthetic? Yes, um, mine, uh, as I say, initially I will uh, I uh, use a cocaine, uh, I've got a small bottle, which uh, uh, is a 10% cocaine. And this, uh, we uh, put uh, uh, ribbon gauzes and keep uh, three on each side going as uh, layers in uh, different uh, uh, in, uh, loops. And I usually keep them in the anesthetic room itself before the patient is wheeled in. So that by the time uh, the, uh, there's knife to skin, there will be a good 10, 15, 20 minutes so that uh, there's enough decongestion. Then on top of it, I will then go with 2% lignocaine with 1 in 80,000 adrenaline. Um, this is mainly if I'm doing not much of injection, for example, if it's for septoplasty or mild amount of rhinoplasty. But if, there's, if a case needs lots of lots of uh, uh, medication, then I reduce this down to 1% and 1% uh, of lignocaine and 1 in 100,000 of adrenaline. So it's uh, just that uh, a mixture of these. Another question from Brazil. Uh, um, mm. Can you adjust the keystone area endoscopically? I don't do that, but I usually, my preferred technique is external approach because I feel it's safe in my hands. Uh, there are other people who do it. Uh, as I say, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, my previous, one of the slides before categorically mentioned that uh, uh, it's your preference, but I would, uh, for such areas, uh, go with uh, my uh, open approach. Uh, another question from Germany, very simple one. Mm -hmm. You pack the nose after septoplasty? Uh, well, good question. I don't. Um, I Hopefully, if all these techniques and if we've uh, gone through all the steps and majority of the times, so you don't need to pack, uh, pack the nose. And also, you feel a bit awkward leaving your packs in and someone else is going to remove it the next day. You don't want to hurt your reconstructive steps. And I wait after the surgery, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, sometimes if there's mild diffuse ooze, I may ask my anesthetist to give one shot of tranexamic acid and still wait. And uh, yeah, uh, very, very rarely I've uh, packed the nose. And uh, one of the times uh, I used to say that and suddenly the next day I had to pack it. So it's uh, one of those Murphy's law, uh, but 99% uh, of the times I don't. Saudi Arabia colleagues is asking, uh, what are your suggestions for post-operative displacement of the cartilage? So if it happens uh, soon after the uh, surgery, as in within the first couple of weeks, I just uh, do it straight in the clinic. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, manipulate the uh, uh, seg segments. But, um, and it's, it's the same for the inside bit as well, because some of them, if they are slightly floating, you could try to, you know, get it back. But if you wait for more time after that, then it's just going to be a difficult situation. Then I will usually wait for the edema, the fibrosis to 
uh, go down. And uh, as I showed you in a couple of these cases, uh, they had approached me, in fact, uh, within a few months after the surgeries, but uh, I waited for six to eight months or even a year sometimes for all the residual edema to settle down and then go and uh, uh, do a revision. Another question from Pakistan, uh, yeah. where the colleague is asking, uh, are you performing septoplasty under local anesthesia? Um, no, I don't. Uh, most uh, surgeries, well, all surgeries we do under GA. Uh, there are certain uh, colleagues who do under deep sedation, uh, but uh, none under local anesthesia. I know people uh, in various other parts of the world who've done it. And in one of my uh, uh, training in... Uh, uh, South Korea, they used to do it in under sedation. Again, if it was rib cartilage, they'll again go down for a GA, but I usually, for all the cases, I do it on a GA. Right. This comes from Montenegro. Do you use spreader graft uh, for simple septoplasty? Oh, no. For simple septoplasty, I don't. But most uh, septorhinoplasties, and especially if I'm doing in the public hospital, um, they will require some sort of uh, spreader grafts, either sometimes uh, asymmetrical as in one side or on either sides, or sometimes it's a combination of one side of auto spreader and on the other side, a, a harvested cartilage. So it's a combination of all of these and uh, there's no one single uh, point. Each case is tailor-made for their own uh, uh, situations. All right. This, uh, this is coming from India. Are you using yeah. columella strut when? Good question. Um, see, if we are using a septal extension graft the way I showed you earlier, that itself could uh, give you the um, uh, point for a, um, as a strut. Um, but if I don't use that, uh, in most cases, I try to use uh, the strut. In some cases where uh, you know, the uh, tip support is uh, adequate, I, and I do not need any further, um, you know, to make any changes, I would uh, not do it. But uh, I would say in a lot of, uh, majority of the cases, I tend to use uh, a strut. Here's the question that is mm. a little bit, yeah, I have to uh, analyze this. Uh, I think yeah. that his colleagues, uh, where he's, he's not asking exactly where, he, he's not reporting where mm. he's coming from, but he's requesting uh, I think that what would you use for tip support uh, where you don't have cartilage? I think that it's like this. Oh, uh, well, that's uh, uh, difficult, isn't it? So you may have to harvest uh, conchal cartilage or rib grafts. Um, and if you don't get them, I also use uh, the cadaveric uh, tutoplast cartilage, which are harvested. And I don't uh, go for any uh, synthetic material if that is what he's trying to get at. Um, so there's a question from a colleague is, if only l strut is kept, then why is this called, called septoplasty? Look, you know, this is the thing which uh, uh, some of these terminologies have come, out, come up with uh, historical uh, as it's, it's all come down. Um, I would say, I think these are all down to semantics, the way you talk. Uh, and I think uh, I wouldn't place too much importance on such uh, semantics but I would rather place more importance of what you do and how you approach the case. You may cause, uh, you can call what you want. You can call uh, septal crafts, which are taken. You can just call septoplasty. You know, if you f keep following those uh, textbook words, which someone else has written before, then uh, you're mixing up your, you know, you, you, you're not gonna be flexible to different cases. So keep all of those, they are all important because they're all being given by masters but uh, be flexible with the semantics and uh, just approach it with as being flexible as possible. That's my, I mean, that's why I gave you those uh, concepts uh, uh, at the beginning itself. Another one, uh, how do you address pure caudal dislocation? Yes, um, I will lift it up like a swinging door. And in fact, uh, you've got to release all the tension in the cartilage because even if you just you know take it inferiorly you will still have certain areas which are hinging so i lift them up and then i uh, uh, create a pocket between the two uh, uh, you know the medial crura uh, sometimes uh, i could i i pass uh, sutures from the uh, skin 
uh, the medial crura and the cartilage in between, and then come all the way around and tighten it. And in certain cases uh, where that is slightly difficult, because sometimes what happens is if you're trying to use that itself as a kind of strut, that in, in some cases you may get a bit of uh, um, columnar retraction. So there I will not do that, but what I'll do is uh, to the uh, caudal end, I tie a suture and then uh, bring it through the um, center of the columella and hoik it down. And then I put the sutures from outside and this suture, I will uh, tape it to the nose for a week to 10 days. And then I uh, cut it in flush with the skin. Oh, last time for two questions. The first yeah. from uh, Amadidi, do you crush deviated pieces and return it back? Yes, that's a good question. Um, when I was uh, getting trained, I wasn't uh, during my resident days, but uh, from my fellowship days and right now, any extra pieces that I've got, of course, uh, they've got to all be uh, slightly relatively straight. Uh, I'm just going to put them back in. Uh, so they're all there for rainy days and also for some good support. Last one from uh, Shambhag. What incision for caudal dislocation? External or internal? I don't, I don't get it exactly what the ah. difference is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it, yeah, I can, I can, I'll try to under, uh, understand and answer this. If it is a pure caudal dislocation and I'm not doing a septorhinoplasty or a rhinoplasty, I'm going to just go with a septoplasty kind of approach, but release from everywhere. And I know that even if I lose some of the uh, 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 in a strength. I know I'm confident in uh, getting the anterior nasal spine hooking onto the uh, uh, caudal end of the cartilage. And so for such cases, I just go for a, a hemitransfection incision, endoscopic, that's enough. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Anil, for your presentation. It was really brilliant and I, I really hope you yeah. uh, uh, would access more in the future. I think that next time we can address something like more anatomical speaking uh, if you do have also some videos, we would like to, course, you, know, yeah. you know, train uh, the resident, but also consultants or whatever it is, you know, yeah. material right now, it's very essential. Thank you, of all of the attendees. Uh, really thank you again for your presentation. I would like to um, keep reminding to all the attendees that our future um, meetings are going to be able for, uh, with the, by using the same link, the same ID number, and, um, uh, please do remind tomorrow's meeting uh, is going to be 3 p.m. on my, one of my maestro, which is not going to be on rhinology, it's going to be on uh, um, retrosigmoid approaches for decompression, and uh, it's going to be with uh, Jacques Magnan. Thank you, Anil, for being with us. Really hope to see you soon, and uh, buona giornata to everyone. Thank Goodbye. you, guys. Good luck. Bye-bye.